This video is about producing Bode plots with GNU plot. It corresponds to section 11.3 of the Applied Analog Electronics textbook. Now, a Bode plot is a plot of gain or impedance as a function of frequency. And it's always done as a log-log plot because most of the phenomena that we see come out as straight lines on the log-log plot. We have things that are proportional to frequency, inversely proportional to frequency, sometimes proportional to frequency squared, and these sorts of curves uh, become straight lines on a log-log plot. Okay, so this is an example that I showed in a previous video of uh, two filters, a low-pass filter in blue and a high pass filter in red. And what I'm going to do in this video is show you how to produce this plot. Um, you will be producing many plots of your own that have similar characteristics to this one so that if you can understand how to produce this one you can do a lot of the different sorts of plots that you'll need for this course. So let's take a look at um, the definitions.gnuplot uh, script, which I actually introduced in a much earlier uh, section of the book. This provides sort of the basic framework for producing Bode plots and for doing a lot of the modeling that we'll do. The first part here, uh, lines 1 through 10, are setting up the plot. It sets log scale xy that says we want a log log plot. I set the X label to be frequency in Hertz and I set an X range. Here I went from 10 Hertz to 1 megahertz. And it's a good idea to use 1E3 for kilohertz and 1E6 for megahertz because it gets really hard counting the zeros. So using the uh, floating point notation for uh, multiples of a thousand and multiples of a million does simplify uh, debugging quite a bit. The next thing here where I set the X format to be percent point one S percent C Hertz, that's not really necessary. What it does is it means the X labels will be readably using metric prefixes. The S says uh, basically take off the, the appropriate um, metric multiple and the C says put in the letter for that metric multiple. Um, and if we go back and look at the plot, that's what's giving me millihertz, hertz, and kilohertz, and here behind my head, and it still only goes up to kilohertz. I didn't take this one up to megahertz. So the plot that I'm showing here is not actually the one that corresponds uh, to, this, to this X range. That's because I will later on change the X range. Uh, so it doesn't go up to megahertz in the final plot. The format here is what gives me the nice labeling, the tick marks. The set MX ticks to be 10 and set MY ticks to be 10 is what gives me the standard logarithmic ticks at 10, 20, 30, up to 90. Uh, you do want to do this because you don't want to have ones that are at uh, 2, 4, 8, or something like that, or 2, 4, 6, 8. Nobody will understand what the hell they mean. So if you want to do logarithmic scale, it's a good idea to always set the minor ticks, MX ticks and MY ticks, to be 10 per uh, major tick. The set key bottom left um, sets the key in the bottom left corner. The capital left here is a question about how the um, the words and the symbols in the legend are aligned with each other. And you can do um, help key in GNU plot to find out what all the different options are. There's a, a lot of options for uh, setting the key. The set samples 10,000. Uh, that's saying when you're drawing the curve uh, for a function, not where you've got data, but when you're drawing a function, um, use 10,000 points and it'll then produce a very smooth curve um, constrained mainly by 
you know, resolution of whatever you're printing on or displaying on. You can zoom in quite a ways. Um, if this is get if this is too slow, you can get by with fewer samples. Uh, for things that change very slow, you can get by with a lot fewer samples. But it's a good idea, particularly if you have something that might have some sharp spikes or something in it, to oversample so that you can get smooth curves and really see what's going on and not get artifacts due to undersampling when you're doing the computation. Set grid turns on a grid for the background so that you can see where the decades are for both uh, the x-axis and the y-axis. Now notice I haven't set a label here for the y-axis because I use these definitions for both um, Bode plots that are gain where the y-axis is gain and unitless and for impedance where the y-axis is the magnitude of impedance and is in ohms. So because the y label changes in different plots I didn't build that into this definitions.canoeplot script. I then have a number of useful functions. For instance, divider, z up, z down, it's a function that just gives me the voltage divider equation. Very simple. j is the square root of minus 1. There is a built-in j, but it's got to be typed in a funny way, like 1j or something like that. So I just make the variable j have the square root of minus 1, so I can do things like defining conjugate and phase. We won't be using those for a while in the class, but eventually we will. Real power it comes in the second half of the course. So it's, there's some useful functions here that you won't need for a while. Uh, and then there's a function here that uh, you will use pretty much right away, and that is the impedance of a capacitor. The impedance of a capacitor is a function of frequency and capacitance. And it is 1 over j omega c, but I didn't have omega here as an input, I had frequency as an input. So it's 1 over 2 pi frequency c. Same thing for inductors, we'll get to inductors much later in the course. Uh, this nonlinear impedance, again, that's in the second half of the course. Um, when we start talking about loudspeakers and electrodes, we'll use some nonlinear modeling. Um, so I toss that in here, you won't need it for a while. And then we have formulas for parallel connection. Um, the general one here, z par 3, says take three things, put them in parallel. 1 divided by 1 divided by z1 plus 1 divided by z2 plus 1 divided by c3. Uh, I've also provided a sort of a shortcut one, uh, which is just having two things in parallel. It's algebraically equivalent. Um, this one slight advantage of doing uh, the z par in um, this format with a multiplication, and that is if one of the numbers is zero and the other one isn't, I don't get a divide by zero with this one, whereas with z par 3, they've all got to be non-zero, otherwise you get a divide by zero problem. Um, but these are, these are sort of convenience functions that you can use in your scripts so that you don't have to go, oh, what's the formula for capacitance? What's the formula for uh, parallel? You've just got built-in things that you can use then very to make your code more readable. So let's now look at not the generic definitions, not GNU plot, which is just sort of something that is available, um, but the specific script that I used to produce the, the filter uh, plot that I had. Okay, the first thing I do is load definitions, not GNU plot. And that just reads those commands in and executes them as if they had been... Uh, part of this script. The way, in fact, that I use this script is I just load it. Um, the point point here maybe deserves a little bit of uh, special attention. That means that the definitions.gnuplot script isn't in the same directory as this script. It's in one directory up in the hierarchy. And that means that I can have the definitions.gnuplot in one place, like if you've got a, a directory for the entire class, you can put the definitions.gnuplot in that directory, and then your subdirectories for each assignment can refer to it with this point point notation. It uh, comes from Unix and it's pretty common to, uh, to see in a lot of different uh, programming languages now. Okay, here I set the title uh, to put at the top of the plot. I hadn't done that in definitions.gnuplot because I had no idea in definitions.gnuplot what those definitions were going to be used for. I also did some fancy things here where I changed the font to be Helvetica size 14. 
don't necessarily have to do that, but if you're having trouble with your fonts coming out too small, sometimes it's worth looking at how to make them bigger. I also set the X label to be in Helvetica 14 also. It had already been defined, but I redefined it here. This redefinition replaces the one that was in definitions of Dr. Nuclon. Um, here I set the X range. Now this is where I changed that X range also. So I wasn't going from what was it, one to a million. Now I'm going from uh, 1e minus 1 to 1e5. And actually, I don't really like that range. I would rather see that as 100e minus 3 to uh, 100e3 because I like to have those uh, exponents be multiples of 3 uh, so that I can easily translate into, well, how many kilohertz is that or how many millihertz is that rather than having to sit there 1e5. Let's see, that's uh, and having to count zeros. Heat counting zeros. Okay. I set a Y label here. Here I'm saying it's the magnitude of V out over V in. And again, I made it in a big font. Um, and here I set the Y range to be from a gain of 1 1,000th up to a gain of 1.2. Um, I set the Y format to be just, uh, I want the Y ticks to be two decimal, two things after the decimal point, but in a good format so that it doesn't, uh, uh, automatically picks whether to use exponent format or um, fixed format. I set some margins here. Again, this is fancy stuff. You don't really have to set margins, but if you're finding that uh, something like your X label runs off the side or one of your X ticks runs off the side, you can increase the margins a little bit. And you can play around with how much space you've got around your plot. And here I set the key bottom center rather than bottom left. And I again set the font to be big. All right, here I have defined two variables r and c and given them values 3.3 e3 that's 3.3 kilo ohms and 470 e minus 9 that's 470 nanofarads and then i created a name for them using the gprintf function which is something unique to gnu plot and it's again trying to get things into a fancy scientific notation uh, or actually engineering notation so that it gets uh, the S does, puts it into engineering notation uh, without the exponent, and the C encodes the exponent as a metric prefix. So this would actually come out as 3.3k ohms, which is how we would like to see it on the plot. And the same thing giving the C name here. This just creates two strings. Here I've computed the corner frequencies, 1 over 2 pi RC. That's the corner frequency. And again, I've done made a string that says print that thing as how many hertz or kilohertz or whatever it is. Okay, you definitely want to use variables, named variables, R, C, R1, R3, uh, things that um, mean something in your schematic. Not putting raw numbers in in the middles of formulas because you may end up having two things that have the same number at one stage of your design, and later on you change one of those. And now, those two numbers that you have in your formula, well, which one's which? One of them needs to be changed, but which one? So always use names for everything. Do all your formulas with variables and not with numbers. The only place the numbers should appear really are places where you assign them to a value or occasionally when you pass them to a function. Um, but basically, if you've got a component value, it should occur once and only once in your script. So there's exactly one place you have to change if you change that value. Okay, so here I've got, again, some fancy stuff that you might not need to do much, but I did it for the plot, and I'll show you how to do it in case you want to. Unset label says get rid of any old labels you've got floating around on your plot, and then I'm going to create a couple new ones. Set label, I'm going to put the corner name, that was the thing that had the corner frequency in it, um, at, and then I say I'm going to put it at the corner frequency on the x-axis and at 0 0.15 on the y-axis. That took some tweaking to figure out exactly where I wanted to put it. I knew I wanted it at the corner frequency, I want it centered at the corner frequency, and then again I used a big font. And then I do set label again, and here I'm doing a sprint to have to say R equals percent S. Percent S is put out a string. C equals percent S. Again, 
C is a string. The percent S is a string. So R name and C name were the way that I had done this fancy formatting up above for the resistor value and the capacitor value. And I said again, I want that at the corner frequency also, but lower down, 0 0.01 on the y-axis rather than 0.15 on the y-axis. And again, I center it, and the font is Helvetica 14 again. Okay, I also going to have an arrow. Well, it's not really an arrow. First, I get rid of any old arrows that might have been floating around from previous attempts to run the script. Then I do uh, set arrow no head. An arrow with no heads is just a line. So the way you draw a line segment that's sort of an um, annotation to your uh, graph is set arrow no head. And then I say from corner frequency 0 0.2 to corner frequency 0 0.7. So that's a vertical line from 0.2 to 0.7 at the corner frequency. Um, and then I'm going to plot, and here's an important thing, I'm going to plot the absolute value because I don't want the complex number, the gain is a complex number. I can't plot complex numbers. Uh, I've only got one uh, dimension on the y-axis, and a complex number is two-dimensional. So I can't plot complex numbers, so I'm going to say I want not the real part, but the absolute value of that gain. I want to know how big is the gain, and I don't care really what phase shifting is going on. Um, so I'm going to plot the absolute value, and then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to have a divider, voltage divider, with capacitor on the top, resistor on the bottom, and the frequency that I'm passing to the formula for impedance of a capacitor is x. It just comes from the x-axis. And I'll say, I'll call this thing high pass and line type RGB red. I'm going to make this a red line. And then I do another one. The backslash here says continue this on the next line. You can't just uh, go to the next line without telling it that this thing is continuing. Um, and I'm going to say I'm going to have the absolute value of a voltage divider with the resistor on top and the impedance of the capacitor on the bottom. And again, the x is the frequency that gets passed to the function. And this is going to be a low-pass filter. And that's going to be blue. And that's it. When I've done all that, I get this plot. Voltage divider stuff at the top. The range from 100 millihertz to 100 kilohertz. Uh, the output voltage from, or sorry, the output gain going from 0 0.001 up to 1.2. And the reason for doing the 1.2 rather than just 1, the function never gets above 1, but I didn't really want the blue line and the red line here to get buried in the frame of the plot. So I gave myself just a little bit of room so that the tick marks here didn't interfere with the appearance of the plot. Here's that printing out the name of the corner frequency. And there was that line at the corner frequency right in the middle here. And then much lower down, I have what the resistor and the capacitor values were, again, using the R name and C name to print those out. And the key centered in the bottom. So this has um, just about all the uh, types of things you might need to do in producing a plot um, other than fitting data. So I did not show any data in this one, um, but all the stuff for plotting functions, for being able to produce Bode plots of um, anything that you can define as a circuit, you can uh, now do with uh, what you have available. Okay, that's probably enough on using GNU plots to produce Bode plots.